not yet. No, not at all. Okay. I see red lights. You guys can hear me? <laughs> yeah? What are you doing? <laughs> no. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي فالحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ثم اما بعد وانس اجين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته ان شاء الله تعالى this evening i'd like to share with you as some of you probably already deciphered some reminders that will help me and you prepare for ramadan ramadan's around the corner and it's a good time to remind ourselves of some important lessons in regards to it. I hope to do three things in this talk with you today. Uh, the first of those things is probably the most ignored in the conversation about Ramadan. The placement of the ayat of Ramadan in the Quran. The Quran talks about Ramadan in one place. Baqarah. That's it. Surah Al-Baqarah. And only mentions it one time. But where is it mentioned and how is it part of the greater teachings of Surah Al-Baqarah? How is it connected to everything that's followed? It's almost like a culmination of several things. So I want to share with you how we get to this point in Baqarah. So we get a, gain a little bit of a bigger perspective. So we understand that Ramadan is part of a larger lesson and larger wisdom that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed in His book. That's the first thing I'd like to do. The second thing I'd like to do is pay attention to the ayat themselves and maybe extrapolate some lessons from the ayah itself in the way in which Allah talks about Ramadan. Just, not just, we all know what the month is and what its significance is, but I want to highlight exactly how Allah Himself talks about it and maybe uh, help ourselves some, derive some benefit from that. And finally, I want to share with you that in this passage, these six ayat that are the entire section of the Qur'an on fasting, like the entire wisdom of fasting and the month of fasting, all of it's captured in these six ayat in Baqarah. In, within these ayat, there is a particular offering from Allah. There's a gift from Allah embedded inside. There's an opportunity, if you will. So I want to talk about that opportunity, inshaAllah ta'ala, at the end. So those are the three things I want to share with you today. Surah Al-Baqarah is divided basically into two conversations. Basically, it's the biggest surah of the Qur'an, but it's divided into two conversations. One of them is the previous nation and their mistakes. Overwhelmingly, the first half of Surah Al-Baqarah talks about Bani Israel, the children of Israel, and the mistakes that they made. Hold on, let him, let him finish taking his call. Hold on. Okay. All right. If you have funky ringtones, put it on silent now. Please. I can't think when you guys... Seriously. You know what's happened to me? It's gotten so bad. I pray at a masjid in Jama'ah. I'm almost waiting for the ringtone. And I'm in shock if I make it all the way to Rukur without hearing somebody go off with their, you know, their 50 cent ringtone or whatever. So, you want me to put on another mic? I don't know, I don't think these are enough. Do you have like eight more? Okay. Okay, is this better? God, the echo is crazy in here. But anyway. So. So. The surah talks about Two, this two conversations, one Bani Israel and the other, the Muslims. The first half of the surah deals overwhelmingly with Bani Israel, the, the, the sons of Israel, how Allah favored them, how many monumental mistakes they made, is a whole list, like a list of counts. You know how a criminal goes to court and they say you are being charged with the count of this and the this and the this and the this. There's a whole charge sheet, a whole counts. 
you know, you're being charged with this crime and this crime and this crime and this crime. And at the end, when all the crimes are listed, what comes after that in court? What's next? The verdict. The verdict. So what we're expecting at the end of that entire conversation is, well, what's the verdict? Within that list of crimes, however, I want to highlight one thing. The Jews of Medina rejected the Prophet ﷺ by overwhelming majority, they rejected him on the basis that he was not from the children of Israel. He was not from the sons of Israel. He was from the sons of Ismail. That was their final basis. But towards the end of the conversation with the Jews, you know, when the, list, the crimes are being listed, Allah says, fine, you don't think he's from the sons of Israel, let's talk about Israel himself. Let's talk about Israel himself. Israel, alayhi salam, his other name is Yaqub. His other name is Yaqub. And Yaqub, his father, what's his name? What's his name? Yaqub's father? Ishaq. And what's Ishaq's father's name? Ibrahim. Okay, so you don't want to, you want to say that he's not from the children of Israel and Israel is your family. So he's not from your family. Is Ibrahim from your family? I mean, they call themselves children of Israel, but is it wrong that they're also children of Ibrahim? Is that true? Sure. So actually, first Allah talks about the great grandfather. The grandfather, actually. Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then he says Ibrahim had a lot in common with Is 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 uh, Israel, which is, whose name is Yaqub. And Yaqub alayhi salam, of all the things Allah could have highlighted, there's one particular thing I want to share with you. And by the way, all this conversation is about Ramadan, as you'll see. The whole thing is about Ramadan. Yaqub alayhi salam is at his deathbed. And his sons are surrounding his deathbed. He's about to die, according to the Quran, and he wants to give parting advice to his kids. How many sons did Yaqub have? How many sons did Israel have? Seven. seven? No, that's not seven, no. Twelve. Remember, twelve sons of Israel become twelve tribes of Israel. So th these are the actual sons of Israel. You know, when we say children of Israel, we think of twelve tribes. We're talking now in this ayah about the actual sons, father and actual sons of Israel. And they're surrounding him, and he's leaving them with parting advice. Let's listen to this parting advice. Am kuntum shuhada id hadra Yaqub al maut. Were you around? Were you witness when death came to Yaqub? When death arrived to Jacob? It, came, it presented itself to him. If qala li banihi, when he said to his sons, ma ta'buduna min ba'di, what are you going to worship after I'm gone? My time is gone. What responsibility? What life will you lead? In terms particularly of worship, because that determines everything else you're going to do in life. Ma ta'buduna min ba'di. So they responded emphatically. They said, qalu na'budu ilahaka. We're going to worship your God. Wa ilaha abaika. And we will worship the God of your fathers. We will stick to the religion of the family, yours and your fathers. And now they're going to mention some of those fathers. They say, Ibrahima wa Ismaila wa Ishaqa. Before they mention, by the way, they are, they are grandsons of Ishaq. Before they even mention their own grandfather, who did they mention before that? Ismail. The Qur'an is arguing, you claim to be sons of Israel. Well, sons of Israel had more respect for Ismail than they even had for their own grandfather. They mentioned him first. First they mentioned Ibrahim, then they mentioned Ismail, then they mentioned Ishaq. How are you turn out, turned off that, by the fact that he's a son of Ismail? What's wrong with you? Ismail wa Ishaq. Ilahan wahida, he's one God, he's always been one God. All the children of Abraham have believed in the same one. And it's also a chronology because Ismail is the older son. And that's important too. It's chronology, the, the most ancient figure, Abraham, Ibrahim, then under him, Ismail, and under him, Ishaq. That's the chronology. And then, then you, Yaqub, our father, and then us, the children of Israel, the children of Yaqub. So there's a chronology. And the chronology is important too. You know why? Because the son to be sacrificed, even the biblical version, sacrifice your only son. Well, the younger son couldn't have, couldn't have ever been the only son. Because you know the Christian argument is the son to be sacrificed was Ishaq. But actually, the only son, the, if, if there was ever a time where there was an only son, it was Ismail. And the Jews tried to circumvent that actually. They developed an alternative view and said, no, Ismail was the illegitimate son. Ma'adallah. Which is an accusation against Ibrahim alayhi salam 
and against Ismail alayhi salam. And Allah says, let me tell you how to resolve that problem. I will tell you what your own fathers, your own fathers, the actual children of Israel, they themselves said. If they didn't honor Ismail alayhi salam, why would they mention his name? They themselves mentioned his name. Ilahan wahida wa nahnu lahu muslimuhun And we are Muslims to him The word they use to describe their religion The sons of Israel The Jews Describing their religion To their father said We are Muslims They call themselves Muslims These are the closing arguments of Allah with the Israelites You have always been Muslim And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is given Islam He's given what you were already given you want to be true to your tradition? Nothing is truer to your own tradition than Islam itself. Look at what Allah, what, what Yaqub himself asked his children. He tested his children. <coughs> Israel asked those children those questions to his children. It's as though still Yaqub questions are alive. How are you gonna answer them? Are you gonna answer the same way your own fathers answered them? Or you came up with your own answers? Who's true to their tradition and who's abandoned their tradition? Allah flipped the question around on them. It's awesome. And once he did that, once he did that, it's established, the case has been established. Then, the case, there's no more arguments necessary to be made. It's, it's done, it's finished. So now what does Allah do? Allah starts talking about Ibrahim again. He goes back to Ibrahim. And he goes to the son that they refuse to honor. He talks about Ibrahim with his son, Ismail. And they were on a project together. Father and son were on a project together. It's, you could call it a construction project. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُوا إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلِ When Ibrahim was raising the foundations of the house along with Ismail. Now, Ismail obviously was left in the Arab lands. And he was left in the city of Mecca. So it's already understood that this construction project is not happening in Jerusalem. The construction project is happening in Mecca, and they know that too. And since they already have respect for Ibrahim alayhi salam, he's building this house. Which house is being referred to? The Kaaba. The Kaaba is, Allah talks about the building of the Kaaba and says, this Kaaba was built by your father too, Jews, sons of Israel. It was built by your father too. He built this Kaaba along with his son Ismail, which your own fathers honored. That's, that's all Allah mentions first. He establishes the legitimacy of the house first. Once he establishes the legitimacy of the house of Allah, the Kaaba, then he tells the Ummah, Oh, by the way, now, فَأَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ فَوَلُّوا وُجُوهَكُمْ شَطْرَةً Wherever you may be, turn in its direction. This is your new Qibla. You do not pray in the direction of Jerusalem anymore. Many of you may not know, the Muslims, until the Allah revealed these ayat in Medina, until then, the Prophet ﷺ used to pray towards Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. He used to pray towards Jerusalem. Like his predecessors, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, the major prophets, they all prayed in that direction. And since the Quran is a confirmation of previous scripture, it didn't contradict that until new instructions came, the prophet used to pray in the same direction. Now, you know what we say? The capital of Islam, the capital of Islam is Mecca. We say the capital of Islam is Mecca. Politically things can change, socially things can change. One thing will never change in Islam. The capital of Islam will always be Mecca. <coughs> when you talk about a capital, you're talking about a nation, yes? And before it was Mecca, what was the, the first capital of Islam before that? The earlier capital of Islam was Jerusalem. Jerusalem. And again, a capital is symbolic of a nation. To have a capital, you have to have a nation first, and then the nation has its capital. Doesn't that make sense? When Allah says, now you have to pray in this direction, it is as though Allah is saying, now you have a new capital. And if you have a new capital, that must mean you are a new nation. It is extremely logical then, that right after Allah talks about us having our new capital, <coughs> He says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا That's how we made you a balanced nation. The conversation about us being a nation comes right after we have been inaugurated with a capital. It's a continuation of that conversation. Now the, here's the really interesting thing. Have any of you ever prayed in a public space? Like an airport or school or anywhere? Okay. So some people walk by, they see you pray. Like I tell you a funny story. Really good friend of mine. I can't name him because this is going to be on YouTube one day. So I can't name him. I'm in college and he knows who he is. 
he's going to watch this and he's going to, when I see him, he's going to hit me with a shoe. But anyway, we're in college and you know, my, I used to always make sure that a good friend of mine is in every class that I go to because my thing was I got the best sleep of my life in classes. So this is like, you know, business law 101 and I'm, I'm totally going to get the best sleep of my life, but I make sure I sit next to my friend, X, you know, right next to me. And it used to be that during that class, class it was Asr time. By the time we got in, before we class started, Asr hadn't come in yet. By the time the class is done, Maghrib has started. <coughs> so we have to leave in the middle of class to go pray. So, you know, I, I'm passed out as usual. And he goes, come on, Asr, come on. And he gets me and we go and we find an empty classroom. We make wudu and we go in an empty classroom. We start praying, we're praying Jama'ah. I'm leading the Jama'ah for some reason and he's following. And our back is to the door. Doors closed, it's an empty classroom. It so happens some girls, I guess, were looking for an empty classroom to smoke whatever. <laughs> so a whole bunch of girls giggling, giggling, they walk into this room and we're in Rukur. Facing away from them. And they walk in and they go, what the? Beep, beep, beep. What's going on here? <laughs> And my friend, X, got so nervous, he got up from Rukur before me, <laughs> even though I was leading. <laughs> but let me tell you, the reason I brought this silly story up, if you're praying in public, if you're praying in public, somebody who doesn't belong to your religion, a Christian, a Jew, a Hindu, an atheist, an agnost, a Buddhist, whatever, a Sikh, whatever. If they see you pray northeast, southwest, if they see you pray in whatever direction, do they care? No, they don't care. These Muslims are crazy, man. They're praying towards that car. <laughs> they don't care. It doesn't matter to them. It doesn't make a difference to them. If the Jews of Medina saw themselves as a separate religion, then whether we pray towards Aqsa or we pray towards Makkah, it doesn't make any difference to them. You guys are misguided anyway, they would say. You guys aren't on the right religion. You pray this way or that way, what do I care? But it so happens that the moment Allah changed the Qibla and the Muslims started praying towards Makkah, the Jewish community in Medina was in an uproar. Ma wallahum an qiblatihim. What's wrong with them? What turned them away from their Qibla? Look at the language. Qiblatihim, al idafa. What turned them from the direction? Their own direction. As though they're saying that that was their right direction. They didn't just say what turned them from the direction. They said what turned them from their direction. That was their direction too. They're offended by it. The fact that they're offended by it, in and of itself proved that deep down inside, they knew this is the right religion. And they felt like they're still a part of it. They can mess around with prophets. We've done it before. Why can't we do it now? But when the capital changed, the capital changed from the family of Yaqub to the family of Ismail. The house built by Ibrahim along with Ismail, they realized they are declaring themselves a separate nation. So they got offended. <coughs> and in their offense, the fact that they got offended, offended gave away that they were already accepting internally that this is the true message. That's why Allah called them fools in that particular ayah. سَيَقُولُ السُّفَهَاءُ مِنَ النَّاسِ Some fools from among the people are going to be in an uproar. مَا وَاللَّهُمْ عَنْ قِبْلَتِهِمْ What turned them away from their qibla? What turned them away from their direction? Long story short, at the end of all those crimes, Allah says, you were the pre preferred nation. I gave you the, the opportunity to be the role model to the rest of humanity of what a nation, one nation under God looks like. That's what the Israelites were told. And you failed that opportunity. You squandered those resources. And as a result, you are being deposed from that position. Your capital is no longer the capital. The capital will go back to the house built by Ibrahim along with Ismail, the Muslims will now pray in that direction. They are a new nation. And when they are a new nation, then the Muslims are told, <coughs> now that responsibility of being role models to humanity that used to be on them, falls on you. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا Now let's move on. We're a new nation. But what makes us different from the previous nation? Surah Al-Baqarah began with that very point. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابِ لَا رَيْبَ فِي كَمَا سَمِعْنَاهَا فِي الْآيَةِ سَمِعْنَاهَا فِي الصَّلَاةِ The same thing we heard in the prayer. This is the book in fact. That's the book that has no doubt in it whatsoever. Which book is he referring to? Quran. Quran is what makes us a separate nation. Quran is what makes us a separate nation. 
Our capital is Mecca. Our constitution is the Quran. Because a nation has to have a capital and also has to have a constitution. And since this constitution has been formed, the day a constitution is ratified or a nation is inaugurated, is there some sort of celebration in any society? Is there some commemoration? Absolutely. We celebrate, for example, in this country, the, de the day the Declaration of Independence you know, was formulated, etc., etc. Every nation has something like that. Now, what does Allah do to us? He says, well, when He talks about Ramadan, I'm coming to the ayah of Ramadan now. Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan, الذي unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The month of Ramadan is the one in which the Qur'an came down. You know the book that makes you a separate nation? It came down in the month of Ramadan. Allah didn't say, Shahru Ramadan, الذي tasumuna fihi. The month of Ramadan is the one you're supposed to fast in. The month of Ramadan is the month of really heavy fried iftars. The month of Ramadan is the month of exhausting taraweeh. The month of Ramadan is whatever. First definition of Ramadan, Quran came down in it. In other words, we are learning something very powerful about Ramadan. You know how every nation celebrates its independence? The 4th of July? You know, Pakistanis what? 14th of August, Indians what? 15th of August, Teis March, Pakistanis, Qarar Dade Pakistan. You know what I'm talking about? The, in, the inauguration of this Ummah is not one day. It's not one day. What is it? One month. You are now celebrating the fact that you are an Ummah on behalf, as a result of this incredible constitution that came from the sky, that is drafted by Allah Himself. You don't celebrate for one day, you celebrate for 30 days. Ramadan is the celebration that we are a new Ummah. That's what it is, first and foremost. It's a recognition that that nation did not fulfill its responsibility, and this nation will. The first thing we're going to recognize about Ramadan is it celebrates our status as a new Ummah. That's the first thing. It's incredible. Who, which Muslim thinks like that anymore? We just think, oh, Ramadan, great time to lose weight. Even though most of you end up gaining weight anyway, because you overcompensate. You know? <laughs> you overcompensate. But anyhow, coming back to the point. Did you know that we prayed in the same directions as the Jews? And we also fasted on the same days as the Jews. Before Ramadan came, the Prophet used to fast. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the same days as the Jews did. Why? Because again, our religion is a confirmation of previous scripture. Until our scripture, revelation from God, doesn't tell us to change things that were already in place, that were legitimate in and of themselves, the Prophet will maintain those practices until he's told differently. So he maintained the fasting on certain days. Those were less than 10 days. Some argue 9 days. Now the first ayah is actually about fasting. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Those of you who have faith, fasting is mandated on you just like it was on those who came before you. In other words, your fasting is no different from their fasting. It's just like their fasting. This is the ayah before Ramadan about the fasting that we used to do before even Ramadan started. But I want to tell you something about this fasting before I go on. My second point about Ramadan. How many days did I say? Before Ramadan? Nine. Oh, nine. Actually, roughly nine. Allah says, Ayyaman ma'dudat. They're just a handful of days. And ma'dudah is more ma'dudat. Jam'u qilla naqul bil arabiya. Jam'u mu'annath salim, jam'u qilla. They say it's a minimal plural. In other words, it's just a handful of days. So before Ramadan, we didn't have to fast 30 days, we only had to fast maybe a little over a week, number one. Allah calls it a few days. Number two, by the way, is that easier or harder than Ramadan? Nine days versus 30, what's easier? Nine days is way easier. Number two, فمن, you know, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرْ Whoever of you is traveling or he's sick, then they can make it up later days. If you miss those fasting days, you can make them up later, and your excuses are two, Either health reasons or travel. You got two excuses. But there's another provision. Those who can afford it and have the power to do so also means those who had the power to fast and they were like, I don't know, I don't feel like it. I don't want to fast. They can actually even pay for it later. 
They can give the feed, they can feed an orphan as compensation for not having fasted. So there were two ways you can make up a fast. What were the two ways? Come on. You can make it up? Number one. What's number two? Sisters, are you alive? What's, the, what's number two? You can feed, not your husband, no, not your husband. You can feed a poor person. And she goes, yeah, my husband. <laughs> I'm kidding. So, you can, you, can feed, you, know, you can feed a poor person. You have two options. And how many days did I say? Nine. Allah says about Ramadan, whoever witnesses this month, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ وَشَارِ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Whoever witnesses this month should fast the entirety of it. Is that easier or harder? That's harder. Now it's 30 days versus, or give or take 30 days versus 9 days. Then he says, فَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنَ يَامٍ أُخَرْ Whoever was traveling and sick, he can make it up. So you can, if you miss a fast, what should you do? Make it up. What used to be option number two? You could pay. You could pay. That option is no longer mentioned. <laughs> the option is taken away. So did fasting just get easier or get harder? Fasting just got harder. And the option has been taken away. The extra option of you can just pay your way out of it is taken away. And then Allah adds, and now the moment you're thinking, man, this just got hard. Imagine those Muslims back in the day, they were used to nine and all of a sudden it's 30, and it's all of them, and you can't even pay, pay your way out of it. They're thinking it's hard. The very next words in the ayah, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرِ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرِ Allah wants ease for you, He doesn't want difficulty for you. <laughs> How incredible is that? Like He knew what we were thinking. I know what you're thinking. I know you think it's gonna be hard. Let me tell you, I don't want any hardship for you. I want ease for you. That's what I'll explain to you in a little bit. The first introduction to Ramadan is that it's a celebration of a new nation. The second introduction to Ramadan, Allah adds Himself. Let's go through it bit by bit. Hudan lin nas. Number two, it's a guidance for all people. It is a guidance for all people. What did the Israelites believe about their revelation? Their revelation, the Torah is a guidance for all people? No, it's a guidance for who? Their own. Allah says, no, this capital is not just your capital now. This is the capital of all those who will believe. And this revelation is not just a revelation for believers. It is an open invitation to all humanity across ethnicities, across continents, across races, and across genders, and across generations. It's open invitation. It's not like your restricted view anymore. Hudan lin nas. By the way, you know what that also means? If this is the month we're celebrating Qur'an, does all of humanity know about the Qur'an? No. And if we're celebrating the Qur'an by just using the word nas in this ayah, Allah already implied that it is the obligation of the Muslim Ummah. They're reminded in this month of the Qur'an that this is guidance for all people. Your job is to spread this word. Ramadan is a reminder that the Qur'an must be spread at the hands of Muslims. It's a reminder that we are obligated to share the word of Allah with humanity. Who thinks of Ramadan like that? First thing Allah said, it's the month in which Qur'an came. Second thing He said, it's a guidance for humanity. Has He even talked about fasting yet? No, not in this ayah yet. And then He says, وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِنَ الْهُدَىٰ <coughs> When you share the message of Islam, the message of the Qur'an with humanity, aren't they gonna ask for proof? Aren't they gonna ask, what's your basis? Aren't they gonna ask, what are your evidences? The very next words, this is a guidance for humanity and a set of proofs from guidance. It's a set of clear arguments from guidance. Because once you start sharing this message, you will need the proof, the criteria, the arguments. And now, so there's this process. Once you share the message, then you convince people of the message. And if they are convinced of the message, they will know the difference between right and wrong. So the final this definition of the Qur'an given is wal furqan, And the criteria between right and wrong. It's so beautifully connected. And so now we have the month of Ramadan, the month in which we will refresh our relationship with the Qur'an, and then we're gonna give it to all people, and we're gonna share it with the rest of humanity, it's gonna be reintroduced to us. Now, let me ask you this. Other than the fact that the, you know, the Qur'an was revealed in the month of Ramadan, there are three things Allah mentions, let me re reiterate them for you. Number one, number one, it's guidance for humanity. Did Muslims already know that? 
Did Muslims of the time, when Allah said Quran is guidance for humanity, did the Muslim already know that? Yes or no? Yeah. He said it has proofs from guidance. Bayinatim min al huda. Did we know that already too? Yes. He said it makes a distinction between right and wrong. It sets the standard between what is right and what is wrong. Did we know that already too? So in introducing us to the Qur'an in Ramadan, Allah told us the very basic introduction to the Qur'an, isn't it? You know what that teaches us? Every Ramadan, I am supposed to go back as a Muslim to the Qur'an as though it is the first time I'm reading it. I'm being reoriented, reintroduced to this book all over again. That's what it's supposed to be. Imagine somebody who just became Muslim. How curious, how enthusiastic, how energetic they are to want to know what this book says, to want to figure it out, to want to understand. That's the enthusiasm every single Muslim is supposed to have the moment Ramadan begins. I want to start all over again. As though I know nothing. You have to start reoriented again, subhanAllah. Now, he says, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهَرِ Whoever witnessed the month of Ramadan. This is very interesting language. Allah could have just said, فَصُومُوهُ Fast the entire month. It's an easy way to say it. سُومُوهُ but he says, whoever gets to witness the month among you. The language seems to indicate Allah is saying, not every one of you will have the honor and the award of being able to witness this incredible thing called Ramadan. Some of you will not live to see it. But if you are among the few lucky that I have gifted the opportunity to, that you get to stay alive these 30 days, then you better celebrate as best you can, because that's an amazing honor. And Allah's way of teaching us to celebrate is fal yasumhu, fast. Fasting is our show of joy. I got to witness this month. You're gonna fast. Fal yasumhu. وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنَيْهِ And by the way, fast, but if you miss any, you can make it up. That's the rest of the ayah. Now, we we'll go back again. I want to go back again before I finish this. Did you know in every profession they have training programs? Police has training, the fire department has training, the military has training or no? Sure. Especially in professions where you are going to be headed towards certain danger and you're going to be facing serious challenges, they have these simulations and trainings ahead of time before they throw you out on the battlefield, put you out on the street, actually have you go into a, a burning building, etc. Because these are challenging, threatening situations. And training is all the more important in those fields. Everybody knows that. Now, in the training itself, when, a, when a, some guy says, I want to work at the fire department, okay, let me take you to our training facility, there's a mock building, and they painted flames on it or whatever. Are they actually gonna throw him into a burning building? When he's in training, day one of training? Go ahead, fifth floor by the way. Are they gonna do that? Police training, they have this building, you gotta go up the stairs, there's criminal like poster things of cutouts of criminals shooting at you and you gotta shoot back at them or whatever. Are they actually gonna have actual criminals in there with guns pointing at you? No, not on day one of your training. You're going to be given those exercises, but there's a level of safety. You're protected. So you can be get better and better, and then you will be thrown out in the real world. Isn't that the case? Ramadan is actually training. Ramadan is actually training. And in training, you have to ease the challenge a little bit. You have to ease the challenge a little bit. So you know what Allah says? Our biggest challenge is shaitan. So in this 30 days of training, what does he do? Locks up shaitan, have, have a good training. I don't want you to mess up in your training. Have 30 solid days of good training. SubhanAllah. But let's talk about what this training is. What's it for? I mean the predominant thing, the, uh, the practical thing we do in Ramadan is fast. Fast. But this is not the ayah of fasting. This is the ayah of the virtues of Ramadan. The ayah of fasting is the ayah before this one. The ayat before this one. What did that? What do those ayat say? What is the purpose of fasting? Kutiba alaykum al-siyam, kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la alakum tattaqun. You were given fasting. Bottom line, you were given fasting so you can develop a consciousness of Allah. You can become aware of God's presence. You can be cautious 
in your speech, in your behavior, in your actions, in your financial dealings, in your family dealings, you would recognize that Allah is watching. You would become ever conscious of the presence of Allah as you are, as you would be if there's a camera on you. As you would be when you're driving and you see the police car. Taqwa takes over. You just slow down, your muscles relax, you start acting all normal, you know. Everything chills out when there's a cop right there, you know. And sometimes you don't even realize there's a cop right behind you, right? And then the lights turn on and you're like, oh, ya laytani. And then he passes by you and you say, alhamdulillah. <laughs> it's a spiritual experience for a lot of you. An ex exercise in taqwa. But let me tell you, Allah according to this ayah, this is the riddle here, Allah says you will fast so that it develops in you what? Taqwa. That's a very interesting correlation. I want, I want to help you and myself understand that correlation. Fasting is of what things? Physically, what things? What do you abstain from? What do you stay away from when you're fasting? Food and drink. And obviously, you know, intimate relations with the spouse. These are the physical things you stay away from. Allah says you stay away from these physical things and you will develop something called something called what? Is taqwa something physical? Taqwa is something spiritual. So you're going to engage in this physical exercise and you will develop something that is not physical in nature, something that is taqwa, spiritual. It's not physical. So how do you take something physical and develop something spiritual? That's the riddle here that I'd like to help solve. So Let's, let's, let's take this one step at a time. It's a hot day in Texas. You're at work, you're fasting. Your coworker, non-Muslim, or not that Muslim. <laughs> He's got one of these, eh, it's hot today, 105. Ah. <laughs> you're looking right at him. At that very moment, does your throat feel something? Your throat feels thirst or no? It does. You go over to your cubicle, next to you there's a guy and he's like chowing down on this chicken. You know, and he tells you, man this halal restaurant is awesome. <laughs> You're like, that's halal? <laughs> does your stomach feel something? Yeah. But there's also another entity inside you, your heart. Your throat starts yelling, give me drink, give me drink, give me drink. And your heart says, hey, throat, shut up. Not until Maghrib. Your stomach says, come on, food, food, feed me, feed me. And you, you, your heart yells at your stomach and says, hey, keep it down down there. I don't want to hear it. Not until what? Maghrib. There's a battle going on inside you between your body and your heart. A, and who's winning for 30 days? Your heart is winning. You're training your heart to win over your body. And where does taqwa live? It lives in the heart. It needs time to work. It needs time to win. If shaitan was released, the heart wouldn't get the opportunity to win as well. And even, it's not just food and drink guys. A lot of you guys are party animals. I know you're here for the program, but you know, let's be real, okay? And you guys, you know, you, you, got, you got whatever on your iPhone, I don't want to know what's on your playlist, it's okay, I understand, you know. And you've got the auxiliary input into your car and you're blasting it or whatever, and you've got the, you know, your, your, your iPad or whatever, you got the Netflix app and you got the Hulu app and, you know, you're watching whatever shows, Allah knows what. Of course, documentaries, that's what you're watching. <laughs> but anyway, you're watching all that stuff, you're going to movies with your friends and once in a while, maybe even a party, that's not exactly halal by the, any stretch of the imagination. But even though you're up to that stuff, yo bro, Ramadan's starting in like three days, man. I gotta get everything out of my system. And once Ramadan starts, even that guy, that guy, you know the guy with the, uh, with the G35? That guy? With the big like, you know, the, the, the weird tints and the spinner rims, that guy? Even that guy is at the masjid. Hey, you wanna go hit up a party, man? No, bro, it's Ramadan. Talk to me in like 25 days. <laughs> you know, think of me when you're there. Even he takes a step back and says, no, I'm not going to do this, man. I can't do it. I'm not going to text her back. 
It's Ramadan, I can't do it. His heart is winning even these other battles. The battles of addiction to entertainment. The battles of inappropriate interaction. The heart is even winning those battles in Ramadan. Shaitan being gone helps a lot. It helps a lot. So the heart is supposed to be getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And all of it so it can develop this thing called what? Taqwa. And Allah said, I'll let you build taqwa, so I'll lock up the shayateen. Do you understand now? So the, the month of Ramadan is our training program. If life is about guidance, and guidance only comes to the people who have taqwa, hudan lil muttaqeen, people who have God consciousness, then this is a month, yearly program where you get to let the heart win for a change, for an entire month. Your heart gets to win. By the way, then Ramadan is over and you have 11 months of a tough battle ahead of you. Will the heart be injured in those 11 months? Yes. So it needs to recuperate and strengthen itself again. So you need to come back as you were before, start all over again. You don't finish this training and you're done with it. You gotta go back and you gotta go back, you gotta go back. It's refresher training for our hearts every year. This is Ramadan. This is what it's supposed to be. It's no joke guys, for you and me. Knowledge is up here, taqwa is down here. You can gain knowledge and gain knowledge and gain knowledge and not have an ounce of taqwa. Taqwa will come when you exercise that muscle, when you let that heart win, subhanAllah. So he says now, فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْ وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرْ فَعِدَّةُ مِنَ يَامٍ أُخَرْ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ Allah wants ease for you. He says he wants ease for me. Why did he make the days of fasting more? How come he took the opportunity to give fidya and get out of, it, out of the problem? Pay my way out, pay the fine and I'm done. How come he took that away? Allah means bigger than just the ease you're thinking, not the ease of fasting only. He wants ease for you in your life. You will never have ease in your life if you don't have guidance. And you will not have guidance until you have taqwa. Allah wants your life to be easy and ease will come only with guidance. That's what he wants for you. That's why he gave you Ramadan. So he said, Ramadan is tough, bro. But Allah wants ease for me. <laughs> That's the attitude. And wala yuridu bikumul usra. He doesn't want difficulty for you. Let me tell you, if I'm talking to my daughter and I say, you know what, I'm putting you in summer school. I'm gonna put you in an extra math class. She's like, oh, summer, I wanted to have vacation. And I put my hand over her shoulder and I say, I don't want difficulty for you. Or first I say, I want, I want you to be happy. And then I say, I don't want you to be sad. Isn't that saying the same thing? I want you to be happy. And what else did I say? I don't want you to be sad. Isn't that the same thing? But somehow when a father lovingly says it to his child, I want you to be happy, I don't want you to be sad. The second time around, it just hits you. Yeah, dad wouldn't want me to be sad. Allah wants ease for you. And he doesn't want difficulty for you. And let me tell you why I gave you this month. Is it, do you get your training certificate? If your training program was 30 days, do you get your certificate if you do 15 days and get out? No. What happens to most people that join a workout program, like an intense workout program? They drop out. Because the waswasa is too strong. You can't do it, you can't do it. Come on, why are you killing yourself? Look at that donut over there. Come on, <laughs> come on. And I can't do this. I'm done. I did a whole week, bro. You know, if shaitan was around, we'd start giving up on fasting in like a week. We don't. You know why? Shaitan's not around. And by the way, let me tell you something else. How many parents here of teenagers? Show of hands please, parents of teenagers. Okay, parents of teenagers, you tell your children, do your homework. How many times you gotta say it? One time, right? <laughs> they say, do your, they say homework, right? I already did it, finished, thanks dad. Thanks for the reminder. Is that what happens? No. What do you have to do? Do your homework. Did I say do your homework? Did you do your homework? Hey, how's it going? How's your day? Did you do your homework? <laughs> homework. I'm not, you're not having dinner until you have homework. <laughs> you better have done your homework. Then they'll post it on Facebook. Homework? Question mark? They'll tweet it. Homework? They'll leave a voicemail. H-W. <laughs> you know? Then they'll call your friend. Yo bro, your mom called me. She said you should do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> they'll repeat. And the thing you don't do, and if you ask the parent, if I go to one of your houses and your dad's yelling at you, hey, do your homework, do your homework, do your homework. 
I turned to the dad and said, why are you saying it like that? He said, well, you know, if he listened, I wouldn't have to do that. And I'm just going to say, well, you know your kid better than I do, so homework away. Do your thing. Did you know Allah tells us to have taqwa in the Qur'an over 200 times? He talks about taqwa well over 200 times. So you can have taqwa, have taqwa, so you can ittaquuhu, la'allakum tattaqoon, la'allahum yattaqoon, man ittaqa, over and over and over, 200 times. Why do you think Allah would talk to us about developing consciousness of Him 200 plus times? Because we don't develop it. If one time would have done it, it would have worked. How many times did He tell us to fast in Ramadan? By comparison, how many times did He tell us to fast in Ramadan? One ayah in the Qur'an. Do the, a huge number of Muslims to this day, no matter how irreligious they are, that one instruction is still being maintained. Allah knew in His wisdom what I need to say one time and it'll work, and what I need to say 200 times. SubhanAllah. But the whole point of Ramadan was to develop the thing that you don't develop. The, one, the thing that had to be said 200 times. Now, وَلِي تُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةِ I gave you this so you get to complete the period. Complete the 30 days. I want you to finish your training. When somebody finishes their training, what do they do? Tell me, call it out. Celebrate, I finished my training, I got certified. I got it. Here's my badge. Here's my certificate. When you finish training, it's time to celebrate. And when people celebrate, Muslims, you know, some Muslims are very conservative, they don't clap or whatever. When somebody goes up to the graduation podium, what do they do? Allahu Akbar. That's what they do, isn't it? It's getting really awkward now because more people are takbir lazy. So the guy goes, takbir. And he's the only one saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> it gets really awkward. But anyway, our idea of celebrating is saying what? Allahu Akbar. Do you know where that comes from? Why do we celebrate with the words? Allahu Akbar. Allah taught us to do that in the Quran when you finish your training session for 30 days. So you can say takbir, you can celebrate in the way Allah guided you. So when Ramadan is over, we're walking over to the Eid prayer, and what are we saying on our way? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. A celebration, man. You just, you just got your certificate. Congratulations. Your heart has just been strengthened. Go out and get that shaitan for 11 months. Go out there and you know, destroy him. And you come out with Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah. لِتُكَبِّرُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ Based on how he guided you. And then at the end of it all he says, وَلَعَلَّكُمْ so you can be grateful. Check this out. Allah says you were given fasting so you can become God conscious. He says you were given Ramadan so you can be grateful. There's a difference. Purpose of Ramadan to make you grateful. But they say like Sha'arawi rahimahullah so eloquently said, ashukru ala ni'mah. Gratitude exists when you do a favor. When do you say thanks to somebody? When they've done something for you. It would be awkward that you meet a stranger. <coughs> you know, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum Hey, you're from, where are you from? Ah, you know, I'm from Jersey. Oh, thank you. You don't just say thank you for no reason. You have to have a reason to say thank you. You understand? Allah said at the end, so you should be thankful. You should be grateful. The question is, grateful for what? Obviously, the general answer is for everything. But what in this particular ayah? What was the first thing Allah said in this ayah? This is the month I gave you what in? What did, what did I give you in this month? You should be grateful for the Qur'an. You can't be grateful for something you haven't tasted. You can't be grateful for the Qari to have recited the Qur'an. You have to be grateful that you tasted the Qur'an. You experienced the Qur'an in this month. And what a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Fasting starves our body and revelation feeds our soul. One thing is getting weaker and the other is getting stronger. So the equilibrium is reached again. Be grateful to Allah that He saved your soul this month. He let it connect with the revelation again. Did you know one of the words for the Quran in the Quran is ruh? One of the descriptions of the Qur'an is Ruh itself. And what is inside of us? Ruh. Ar-Ruhu yufidu ruh The angel Jibreel is also called Ruh. It'll feed our soul. 
It'll feed us, it'll strengthen us spiritually. Spirituality in Islam is directly connected to revelation. The most spiritual people are the ones who cry before Allah. Isn't that true? The most spiritual people are the ones that cry, they can't even help themselves, tears come down their eyes. That's a spiritual experience. And what does Allah say? These are the people when they recite revelation, tears come down their eyes. He even connected crying to what? Quran. He connected Surah Al-Isra, he connected crying to Quran. That's what's supposed to happen this Ramadan. This is the training I wanted to talk to you about. But I told you, I want to conclude this conversation today with a reminder of the bonus. There's something Allah has given us, an additional bonus in this month that we should really take opportunity of, really take advantage of. Some of you may have heard me talk about this. I know the lecture is out on YouTube or whatever. I don't know how everything gets on YouTube. But I don't care, I'll talk about it again. Because Quran repeats itself, why can't speakers repeat themselves? وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي The conversation happening up, up until now in these ayat was كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا You who believe, Muslim community, I'm talking to you. In the very next ayah, Allah doesn't talk to us, He's talking to His Prophet wasallam, And He says, whenever my slaves ask you about me. Whenever my slaves ask you about me. Do you know the difference between when and if? There's a father whose son goes to the army. Does he say, if my son comes back, I'll be so happy? What does he say? When my son comes back, it'll be amazing. He never says if, because if is hopeless. If seems to suggest in my mind, maybe he's dead, or he's not making it. But his hope is alive, so he says, in anticipation and love, in joy, he says, when. Allah didn't say, if my slave asks you about me, he said, when my slave will ask you about me, because Allah is waiting in anticipation for you to ask about him. For me to ask about him. He didn't say if, he said when. When are you going to ask about me? When are you going to want to learn more about me? And who should you ask? You should ask the right teachers. So who do they come and ask? The Sahaba, Ibadi? Who do they go ask? The Prophet ﷺ. Now here's the logical flow of the conversation. I want you to appreciate these subtleties in the Qur'an. If they ask you about me, then tell them, then tell them I am near. That's the supposed ayah. Allah did not say, then tell them. فَقُلْ لَهُمْ لَمْ يَقُلْ لَمْ يَذْكُرْ هَذَا إِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ If my slaves ask you about me, you don't tell them I am near. You know what? I'm going to tell them myself. Then I am near. All you had to do to get close to Allah was ask about Him. Somebody says, I feel, God, I feel so distant from Allah, man. I feel so distant. Allah says, have you asked about me? You know when you miss someone, you ask about them. You know that, right? You miss Allah, you want to talk to Him, ask about Him, Allah guarantees. And by the way, don't be in any doubt, I am near. Inni qareeb. But the ayah said, if my slaves ask you about me, ibadi. Somebody might say, but I'm not a good slave. I'm not, I'm not that good. Maybe Allah is close to the people that are good, but I'm, I'm not one of those guys. How can He be close to me? Allah says, ujibu. I respond. And before I share this with you, you need to understand the comparison. How many of you work for a big corporation? If you work for a big corporation, maybe 500 employees, 1,000 employees, how often do you see your CEO? You don't. If maybe you saw your CEO, how long would it be? Oh, minutes are pretty heavy. It might be a couple of seconds maybe. You know, he'd walk by your cubicle and he'd say maybe one word, how's it going? And you'll be like the highlight of your life, you know, who said, how's it going to me? <laughs> that was amazing, bro. <laughs> and I was like, I'm alright. Yep, I responded. <laughs> 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 when somebody is very high up, and is responsible for a lot of people, then he doesn't respond to every one of the requests. He doesn't have time for you, you have to make time for him. You, he won't make time for you. I can't say, well, you know, I was listening to the radio and I heard Obama's speech. I didn't like what he said. You know what? I'm going to give him a call. <laughs> Yo, what you saying, man? Why you got to say it like that? Is that going to work? No, because he's a little higher up. Just a little bit, you know? I can't, I can't just have a direct conversation. Yeah, now, the lowest employee in your company is who? 
Don't say me. <laughs> like the guy, there's maybe the intern, maybe the secretary, maybe the janitor, the lowest status in your organization, the lowest status. And the CEO would be the highest. The, the word slave, is there any lower job description in existence? No. Slave means there's no one below you, bro. You know, there's no one below you. And Allah is Rabb, which means there's no one higher than Him. So now you're talking about communication between the highest possible and the lowest possible. In every other situation in the world, this conversation is impossible. And if it happens, it'll happen. If you get lucky, if you really get lucky, it might, might, might happen by chance. It might, might occur, but you're not going to be able to... And if it happens, it won't be regular. It's weird. Allah says, I am near to my slaves. First of all, you would think master should be distant from slaves. But this supremely high says, as low as you are as slaves, I am near you. And on top of that, you know, um, he can't respond to... Uh, uh, someone up above doesn't respond to all your requests. Allah says, Ujibu, I immediately respond. I immediately respond. What comes first, request or response? Logically speaking, what comes first? Allah didn't even mention the request. That is ida da'ani. That's the request portion of the ayah. We haven't even translated that yet. Allah says, "I'm so anxious to respond. I'll mention my response first. I'll mention the request later." Subhanallah. Ujibu da'wata da'i is first. Ida da'ani is later. It's incredible. The actual sequence is إِذَا دَعَانِي أُجِيب When he calls me, I answer. He says, no, I answer when he calls. He mentions his enthusiasm. First we learn he's in wait. He's waiting for us to ask about him. Then he says, I will call, I will respond immediately. By the way, there are two, uh, two words for answering. There's أَسْتَجِيبُ and أُجِيبُ أَسْتَجِيبُ means, I will try to answer or I will answer over time. Two meanings. I will try to answer and I will answer over time. Also means I want to answer. Just because somebody wants to answer, does that mean they actually answer? No. But if you say ujibu, it means I immediately answer. People that are important, you have to leave them voicemails and they will maybe call you back in two years. Allah says, you don't have to leave me a voicemail. I'll respond immediately. But the thing is, and I'll give you another example to help you understand this better, I had to take my daughter to a specialist. One of my daughters, she needed to see a specialist. And these specialists, they're very rare. You know, every city has two or three. Maybe. And you go to them and they have a long waiting list. And they give you an appointment three months later. And it's not up to you what day. They say there's an opening, you want it or no. Take it or leave it. So you take it. And if you're 10 minutes late, what are they gonna do? Another four months, five months, go. I don't have time for you. When you have to meet with someone important, your schedule doesn't matter, their schedule matters. Isn't that logical? Doesn't that make sense? Allah says, I respond to the call of the caller, Ida da'an, whenever he calls me. Call me whenever you want. Middle of the day, middle of the night, whenever it's convenient for you, I the most high will make immediate time for you the most low. Isn't that something? <laughs> the power of dua. Allah is inviting you and me to make dua whenever. Whenever. Ida da'an. But there's more. I want to share a couple more things with you. He says, da'wa, da'wata. What is this called in, in Arabic? Some of you, even if you don't know Arbi, you know this word. What is it? Dua. He didn't say, Ujibu dua ad da'i. He said, Ujibu da'wat ad da'i. Da'wa, with this tam or buta at the end, I know I'm getting Arabic a little bit, but I'll, I'll simplify it in a sec. This tam or buta actually is called mastar marra. What this means in the English language is something that happens at a single moment. Allah is saying, I'm not talking about me responding to someone who makes dua all the time, he prays to me all the time, even if there's a guy who's never prayed to me and he decided one time to turn to me sincerely. One time he made dua to me. That guy, I'm talking about that guy, da'wata, a single call. And then he said, ad-da'i, I respond to the call of the caller. Let me tell you this, a caller could be anybody, isn't it? A caller could be anyone. Does a caller have to be a righteous person to be a caller? No, the Arabic word caller captures anybody. 
Allah didn't say you have to be this righteous, your beard has to be this long, you must have prayed this many prayers, you must have finished Hajj, you must have done this and this and this, and you must be pur purified of all these sins before you get to call me. He says, so long as you're a caller, and even if you call once, I'll respond. How many calls does he get? Can you imagine? Now when you get a lot of calls, is it easy for you to, for you and me, to forget who was I talking to? I have a horrible memory. I mean, I mix up my kids' names. I have a terrible memory. Brother comes up to me and says, Brother, I met you last year at the convention. I was like, okay. <laughs> I just, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I start my conversation with an apology. I'm sorry, I don't remember. You know, you look familiar though. Like, kind of Muslim. You know, <laughs> that's all I can say. I can't say much more. Allah did not say, and by the way, when somebody is anonymous, you call them a caller. When somebody is known and recognized, you call them the caller. Allah didn't say, Ujibu da'wata da'in. He said, Ujibu da'wata da'i. I respond to the call of the caller. Meaning, he's not just anyone to me. He is not an a, he is a the. He is particular to me. He's unique to me. He's an individual to me. So you and I have a direct, no shared access with Allah. In which He recognizes every one of our presences. And every single one of our du'as. Because du'a could have been all du'a. But da'wah is every single one of them. With the Tamar Buta'atiya. Da'wah tadda'i. Whenever you call. This is Allah's invitation. This is the passage about Ramadan, right? When is this invitation most open? Ramadan. You really want to get your act together with dua? When do you get that jump started, super jump started? Ramadan. He is near. He's opened that invitation. Let me conclude with this. This ayah. فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا <laughs> Then they should try to respond to me. He said, I respond over time or immediately? What did he, which one did he say? You remember? I respond immediately. Allah didn't say, well, you should respond immediately too to me. He said, no, then they should at least try to respond to me. They should at least want to respond to me. Allah says, I'm not expecting too much from you. At least give me a sincere effort. Don't give me ijaba, give me istijaba. Fal He changed, he switched the verb. See, that's why Arabic is important, guys. You read the English translation of the ayah, you probably 90% of what I shared with you today is not there. And when you, when you make that intention, I guarantee you Allah will open doors for you you never imagined. I guarantee it. Because Allah guarantees it. So He says, فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُوا Try to respond to me. وَلْيُؤْمِنُوا بِي And they should believe in me. Allah mentioned believing in Him at the end because when people pray to Allah, Ya Allah, get me a raise. Ya Allah, let me marry that girl. Let the family say yes. I know her father hates me, but please, somehow, <laughs> put something in his heart. Put something in his heart. And the girls make dua, Ya Allah, not that guy. Please, not that guy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, you know. You're making dua, and sometimes you don't see the results of your dua. Sometimes you don't, you don't see the results immediately. And then you start thinking, well, God said He's going to respond immediately. Where's my raise? <laughs> ya Allah, by the time I reach my car today, my 1978 Cutlass Sierra in the parking lot, let it be a BMW M5. <laughs> 2012. <laughs> Navigation, spinner rims would be nice. Amin. <laughs> And you get to the parking lot, you're like, what's up, God? <laughs> it's Ramadan and everything. It did not, nothing working. No, 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 no. Allah says, the prayers are answered not on your schedule. Allah will respond, but He will give you what's best for you. You don't even know what's best for yourself. Allah knows what's better for you. He'll respond though, in His way. In, and His way is way better than your way, trust me. So that requires you to believe Him, that His way is better. His way of responding is better. I'll give you a small example of that. A mother is afraid that her baby is going to die. A mother is afraid. Mother, is, mother of Musa is afraid her baby is going to die. Allah says, breastfeed her. Breastfeed the child. Ayah comes, just feed the child. You might think, my ba soldiers are coming to kill. If they hear a baby make a single noise, they're going to kill a baby. You're telling me to feed the child? No, she trusts the and she starts feeding the child. And guess what? When a child is being fed, does the child make noise or no? So they don't hear the child. 
<coughs> no, if she tries to hide the child, put a blanket over him, whatever, is he gonna, a little bit of a eh, and it's over. Allah gave her the best thing she could have had at that very moment, feed your child. And if you really get scared, here's what you do, put him in the river. If you're afraid, put him in the river. Now the thing is, putting him in the river was the best thing that mother ever did because she believed in Allah. Because you know why? That river got him to a palace. And when he got to the palace, he was already, Allah had put in the heart of that baby that he will only drink that flavor of milk. So no matter how many wet nurses you bring him, he will not accept. <coughs> How would a baby know the difference between this and milk and that milk? Well, Allah installed that software way back when she was at the house, when she fed him the first time. So he's used to that flavor, that's it. He can't have anything else. So he doesn't have to recognize, he's not even old enough to recognize his mother. But he's old enough, his heart is mature enough to recognize that milk. And that's how she gets the job at that house. And her baby's safe. Her baby's gonna be safe there, safer than anywhere else. Inside the palace. Who's gonna go door to door inside the palace? SubhanAllah. Allah has His way. Allah has His way. You and I have, we think our way. Allah should do it our way. No, no, no. Allah's way is way better. If Allah's way happened and the soldiers didn't catch the baby that day, is it possible to catch him the next day or the day after that or the day after that? It's possible. What Allah set up for her was terrifying in the beginning, but it saved her and her child's grief. Allah had bigger plans. We have to, that takes trust. Well, you mean be. This is the last part that I'd like to share with you. Allah said, fasting was given so you can get what? Taqwa. Ramadan was given so you can be what? Grateful. Dua is given so you can get straight. You can be heading in the right direction. You can be guided. Allah is saying there's a direct connection between talking to Him, asking for things, and being guided. That is why the surah of guidance, the surah of Fatiha, how do we ask for guidance? In a dua, ihdina. We're learning guidance and dua are one and the same. They're fused together, they're inseparable entities. And you and I, if we're not making a lot of dua, then I can guarantee you, we do not have a lot of guidance. Allah says, they should believe in me, they should ask me, they should try to respond to me, so that they can be set straight. You don't make dua and you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have problems. And don't, don't be like one of those obnoxious du'a people. You know what an obnoxious du'a per person is? You know, bro, I had, an, I had a midterm, and I, was, I made like so much du'a, and I still failed. That's why I don't pray. <laughs> this is, du'a is not Amazon.com. I placed the order, and I said expedited shipping, and it didn't show up, I don't give them orders anymore. You're, you're not Allah's customer. You don't place orders with Allah. You know the people who talk like that were the followers of Musa. Ud'u lana rabbak, yukhrij lana. Call your, make dua to Allah, give us something. Come on, hook us up. The, fo the followers of Fir'aun talk like that. Ud'u lana rabbak, call your, call your master, make these, these nine signs stop. Make them stop. You think you're entitled to get Allah to do what you want to do? Then you sound like the misguided followers of Fir'aun or the misguided, you know, excuse of followers of Musa alayhi salam. That's what you've become. Come on, don't have an attitude when you make dua to Allah. Understand, He's the highest, you are the lowest. Maybe you forgot that. Just because He made Himself available, you think you just, you lose your place. You start thinking, man, I made dua and nothing happened. Come on. You can't have that attitude. You can't. And a lot of people lose faith because their du'as are not answered. So, yeah, I'm, I'll, one minute and I'm done inshallah. A lot of people lose faith because their du'as are not answered. We have to be the people, the more we make du'a, the more our iman increases. May Allah Azza wa Jal make the month of Ramadan a month of taqwa for us, a month of gratitude for us, and a month of being set guided for all of us. Barakallahu feekum, barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim, wa nafa'ni wa iya'akum bil ayati wa dhikr al-Hakim. One last announcement for all of you, inshaAllah ta'ala, it's a request. Some of you know, a lot of you don't. If, I, if you can remember this website and visit it and share it with family and friends, amazedbythequr'an.com amazed by the Quran.com. It's the first conference that I and my colleagues have tried to put together. It's, it's uh, gonna be a yearly event myself, Sheikh Abdul Nasir and Imam Suhaib Webb, 
from Boston, he's flying in from Boston. The three of us are gonna have a one day program in Dallas. And it's actually fairly close to the airport and it's on June the 30th. It's a family event and we're expecting over a thousand people to attend inshallah ta'ala maybe even about approximately two thousand so i'd like as many of you to be a part of that youth groups here should take a bus out there family should go inshallah it should be a great event for the family too babysitting is available you can sign up for that online also what's the website amazedbythequr'an.com thank you so much for listening